गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स टूडेज टॉपिक ऑफ डिस्कशन इज पेप्टिक अल्सर डिजीज एंड एज वी नो इट इज अ वेरी कॉमन डिजीज एंड टाइटिटी एंड लॉट ऑफ पीपल्स आर अफेक्टिंग बिकॉज ऑफ दिस डिजीज एंड इन दिस एरा ऑफ लॉकडाउन मोर देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ द आर कलीग्स आर ऑल्सो हैविंग सम और अदर स्ट्रेस रिलेटेड पेप्टिक अल्सर डिजीजेस टूडे वी विल नो द डेफिनेशन क्लिनिकल फीचर्स बाई विच वी डायग्नोज द अल्सर डिजीज वट आर द इटियोलॉजी एंड पैथोलॉजी ऑफ द डिजीज हाउ टू डायग्नोज एंड कन्फर्म whether the person is actually having peptic ulcer disease or some other vague dyspepsia or some more risky life threatening disease that is the differential diagnosis of peptic ulcer and in the last we will see what are the treatment options for us especially the medical aspect of the disease as we know that all diseases had got multi factorial causes presentation and treatment modalities the lot of surgical treatment also which we will just see as an overview but let's see what we can gain from today's discussion if we try to define the peptic ulcer disease any ulcer as you know from the history of your surgical third year classes any ulcer is a break in the continuity of the epithelial layers similarly here also the peptic ulcer is a defect in the gi mucosa that extend through the muscularis mucosa and this definition of ulcer is same for any type of ulcer anywhere in the body the pathophysiology of this ulcer r it is both for gastric as well as duodenal ulcers before the etiopathology let's share some physiological aspect of gastric acid secretion we know that the gastric acid secretion has got three phases one is before the food reaches to the uh, stomach and the third is when the food leaves the stomach that is the syphilitic phase where the stimuli is the sight smell taste or thought of the food this activate the vagus histamine and gastrin receptors and will cause increase in the gastric acid secretion the actual actual food in the stomach will cause reflex stimulation of the gastric acid as well as lot of enzymes by local reflexes that is m3 receptors the chemical substances present in the food and the increase in ph that is if the ph increases toward the alkaline side which causes inhibition of somatostatin release and when the food leaves the stomach that is the chyme in the duodenum will give a negative feedback to the local and distant pathways to decrease the activity of acid as well as lot of enzymes which are secreted from the stomach in the act of digestion so the mechanism of ulcer formation may be divided because of the main process of high hydrogen ion in the gastric lumen we know that the acidity of the gastric 
cavity is 2 to 3 pH which is a very high acidic level and it can coagulate dissolve lot of non-human things also it requires defense mechanism to protect esophagus and stomach because if this acid can dissolve lot of foreign bodies which are very tough in nature then how the mucosa which is very friable can be protected with this acid of the esophagus and stomach so there has to be some defense mechanism in this local area there are two sprinters located one is proximally that is lower esophageal junction and one distally is in the duodenal area which act in accordance of the food and they contracts and dilate accordingly to relieve the food which is partially digested in the stomach there are number of defense mechanisms available in the, in the stomach like mucus secretion this slows ion diffusions especially the hydrogen ions prostaglandins they had a very good defense against the HCl or hydrochloric acid induced digestion of the cell which may be inhibited by alcohol, NSAIDs and other drugs which we will discuss later on bicarbonate ions because we know that the content is acidic and if there is some bicarbonate ions then it may both can counter it at attack and it may help in decreasing the acidic contents and ulcer healing and very high blood flow in the stomach mucosa is also a factor which decreases the dead cells very high turnover of the cells and the blood flow increases the nitric oxide contents also and which is used as a ulcer protective agents so in a patient where the blood flow is less because of any reasons that will decrease the nitric oxide content of the muscularis mucosa and will cause ulcer formations that is specially seen in burn patients and in shock patient where the blood flow to the gastric mucosa is decreased because of decreased cardiac output under normal condition a physiological balance exists between peptic acid secretion and gastro duodenal mucosal defense thus peptic ulcers occur when the balance between the aggressive factor and the defensive factor is disrupted the aggressive factors like NSAID, H. pylori, alcohol, bile reflex, acid, pepsin, they can alter the mucosal defense by allowing back diffusions of hydrogen ion and subsequent epithelial cell injury. The defensive mechanism include tight intercellular junctions, mucus, mucosal blood flow, cellular reconstitutions and the high epithelial turnover this is a graphic representation where normally this seesaw is in the center and will keep both the factors in concordance but because of some reasons this is decreased and defensive factors if it is less they can cause ulcer formations and this is the crux of treatment which we will discuss in our further lectures 
the major etiologies of ulcer formations are helicobacter pylori this is a gram negative bacterium can live in stomach and duodenums for months to years without having any problem because of the high gastric acid contents because they break mucus layer and this inflammatory response will cause a small ulcer the gastric acid needs to be present for ulcer to form that it activates the pepsin and the it, it induces the mucosa the decreased blood flow because of lot of causes which we have discussed right now will cause decrease in the mucus production and bicarbonate synthesis and decrease nitric oxide synthesis and hence it promotes gastric acid secretions and ulcers nsaid non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs they inhibit the production of prostaglandins there are two types of nsaids like cox1 and cox2 inhibitors cox1 inhibitors are predominantly uh, there in the gastric mucosa in renal cells and in lot of other organs but the cox2 inhibitors are usually found in the neutrophils dendrites and other cells of inflammations that means if we inhibit cox2 inhibitors that will cause decrease in the inflammation by decreasing the interleukin cytokine production from the red uh, wbcs and if we decrease the production of cox1 inhibitor they will have a harmful effects on the stomach wall the cox2 inhibitors inhibitors like rofecoxib silicoxib they are very good anti inflammatory agents because they were very selective for cox2 enzymes but it was found that these cox2 inhibitors are more causing cardiac death and hence they were all banned now usually we had more of a cox1 inhibitions in our nsaid group similarly smoking this stimulate nicotine production and nicotine is a positive effects on gastric acid production this is a schematic diagram of h pylori bacterium this produces urease enzyme which convert the urea to ammonium and carbon dioxide and in this way it can stay in the hostile environment of the gastric cavity without having any problem it is a gram negative flagella and it is one of the most common etiology of peptic ulcer disease in fact the person who discovered this h pylori was awarded a nobel prize for his discovery it is usually transmitted in the fecal oral routes it converts urea to ammonia and hence it can remain stable in hostile environment as for etiology almost 70 to 80% of the duodenal ulcers are caused by h pylori compared to the gastric ulcers and it is a class 1 carcinogenic indications for gastric cancer and malt associated malignancies gastric ulcers as we know it is very common in the middle age and the incidence increases with the age of the person male of course twice compared to the female because of lot of reason as we have seen like smoking and stress use of nsaid associated with 3 to 4 times increase in the risk of gastric ulcer that too depends whether the patient is taking this nsaid for how much time duration 
air whether it is taking without any gastric protective drugs or he is taking solo NSAID and in 10 to 20 percent of the patient the patient may have both gastric and duodenal ulcer duodenal ulcers are more common in middle age groups and more male predominance compared to gastric ulcers they had got a genetic links also and 95 percent they are positive for H. pylori compared to gastric ulcer. As we know, duodenal ulcers are less common to turn into malignancy, but they are more common for surgical obstructive lesions in the duodenal area. The sign and symptom of peptic ulcer diseases they had the most common symptoms are epigastric pain which may be growing, burning, it may be relieved by food or antacid, the patient may awake at night because of the pain, the pain may radiate to the back, it may be because of the ulcer disease or it may be a sign of perforation. The duodenal ulcers occur specially one to three hours after meal and may awaken the patient from sleep compared to the gastric ulcers. This pain is relieved by food, antacid or vomiting if it is a surgical cause. The gastric ulcer food may increase the pain while vomiting relieves it. Similarly, the patient may have nausea, vomiting which may be related to the partial or complete gastric outlet obstruction. The dyspeptic symptom like blenching, bloating, distension and fatty food intolerance is also seen heartburn chest discomfort discomfort anorexia weight loss if these are present we should think of advanced disease or maybe a sign of malignancy also hematemesis if it is bleeding is above the ligament of teats it may cause hematemesis and if it is below that ligament it will cause melena if the bleeding is insufficient amount that is more than 60 ml in 24 hours. The dyspeptic symptoms that might suggest peptic ulcer disease are not very specific because only 20 to 25 percent of the patient with symptoms suggestive of peptic ulcer disease are found to be positive on lot of investigation which we will see right now. Physically we will not find any positive finding except mild epigastric tenderness. If we go for stool stool examination, it may be positive for blood. And if there is gastric outlet obstruction, we can have suppression splash and other finding of lot of fluid in the gastric cavity. The patients of acid peptic disease are suffering from last many months to years and it is a very common symptom of this generation where everybody is busy in hurry, worry and curry. That means any person who is hurry that is stressful, worry, think a lot and curry that means a diet which is high in spices, non-veg will cause more of acid peptic diseases, but we should be able to early diagnose any neoplasm of the stomach which also initially will present like acid peptic disease and if not corrected it has got a very high mortality. Similarly, pancreatitis, pancreatic cancer are also major differential diagnosis in a patient who is elderly. In a female or early age, we can have non-functional dyspepsia that is functional symptoms also. Similarly, the patient may have cholecystitis also which can present with peptic ulcer diseases.
and of course gastritis GERD are also a major differential diagnosis for this disease not to be missed is myocardial infarction which also initially present in a patient who is elderly, who is obese, who is diabetic. These type of patients may present with only dyspeptic symptom and if in fact they are very comfortable after taking few bottles of antacid and they lose the golden hour, golden hour that is 6 to 8 hours or 4 to 6 hours of early thrombolysis which is in a diabetic patient, the patient may not have a classical pain of MI, he may have a dyspeptic symptom of ulcer disease. So you should be very comfortable and you should be very clear that what you are dealing and accordingly you should advise the patient for investigation. If you are suspecting a cardiac etiology, we should go for the ECG, cardiac enzymes and echocardiography and if you are not suspecting a cardiac disease, if you are suspecting gastric component, you should go for the best is invasive that is endoscopic examination. In endoscopic examination, you can clearly see the ulcers in the lower esophagus, any obstructive pathology in the lower esophagus, any change in the mucosal structure, barrets or any early malignancies in the esophagus can be seen. It can be biops biopsied also and in the gastric and in the duodenal area, we can thoroughly see any bleeding ulcer, any telltale signs of ulcer, old ulcer, any scar, any 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 uh, symptoms, signs of malignancy and of course we can take the biopsy from adequate place also and which can be proved later on. Similarly, we can go for rapid urease test in which we can diagnose whether the patient is infected with H. pylori or not. Other tests like barium meal and other investigation are not so commonly used right now because of their own limitations and now we had plenty of people who can do the endoscopy and that is having a upper hand compared to all other old investigations. The non-invasive test like serological test for H. pylori or urea breath test can also be used for the diagnosis of H. pylori active inflammation. Now the management if you are confirmed that the patient is having peptic ulcer diseases, now we have to manage the patients. We have to manage in the specific clinical situations. We have to know the etiology of the disease and the anticipated natural history of the disease and we have to manage accordingly. The first step in the management are to identify H. pylori infection and user of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are the most common causes of ulcers. So by dictum, we should go for the common etiology first rather than suspecting malignancies or other non-common disease in the earlier course. But what are the markers of increased risk that are a prior history of complication like if there is peptic ulcer perforation or any fibrosis or gastric outlet obstructions is there, then these patients are at increased risk of further complications or a prior refractory or protective course of many months. A giant ulcer more than 2 cm on endoscopy or the presence of considerable depth or dense fibrosis as suggested by a deformed ulcer bed or if the ulcer is also 1 to 2 cm, it deserves more cautions than a ulcer which is less than 1 cm in size in upper J endoscopy. If the patient is H. pylori sensitive ulcer, 
then we have to give the triple therapy which we'll discuss right now for a prolonged course to clear this infective organism the goal of treatment in ulcer associated with h pylori is to treat once successfully that means we have to give the course for adequate time duration that is usually 10 to 14 days it is important to remember that h pylori ulcer recurs within 6 months in up to 20 percent of the patient after apparently successful antibiotic treatment that is a different issue but we have to treat the patient in almost 80 percent of the patients patient with a known ulcer history these are the simple guidelines we which we should follow when we know that the patient was having ulcers prior the nsid should not be used for long duration of time it should be used for smallest time and durations and if we still feel that the nsid has to be given then it has to be given with some anti ulcer drugs like proton pump or the newer misoprotol or sucralfate which can be combined with nsids h pylori should be taken care and in fact after giving the triple therapy for h pylori the patient should be on proton pump for a minimum of one month post triple therapy for h pylori to clear the ulcer which is there in the gastric or duodenal wall and if the patient is h pylori negative it requires special attention to ensure that h pylori infection has been excluded and to detect nsaid use in confirmed non h pylori patients non nsaid ulcer the first consideration is excluding an acid hypersecretory state that is zollinger ellison syndrome this is the most common differential diagnosis of a non h pylori ulcer because here the ulcers are many they are recurrent they are complicated and are in the unusual locations and are very difficult to treat and if we are able to treat they recur very early so if the patient is having and there is some family history then we should always think of this etiology so a refractory ulcer it is important to remember that many refractory cases even after prior failed surgery are due to occult consumption of aspirin and nsaid the more problematic the ulcer the more critical the search for surfaces aspirin or nsaid used in fact all the villagers are using some or another nsaid for their daily uses for arthritis for body ache for this pain or that pain and it is very common if you don't get take a good history you may miss the nsaid use similarly aspirin or other drugs are used in all comorbidities like cardiovascular disease in cardiac uh, cns disease and lot of other diseases even in uh, pregnancy also we give aspirin so you should be very cautious regarding the history of aspirin and nsid because as for the patient they feel that they are taking this drug for many months to years and it may not be the cause of the present episode because right now they are suspecting some acute diseases or some acute causes and so the patient does not give you the history that they are taking aspirin or nsid since long so in peptic ulcer the therapy is directed at enhancing host defenses or eliminating the aggressive factor that is the seesaw which had we had seen in the earlier slides initially the first treatment of acid is to neutralize it it is a rational thought that if there is lot of acid production 
we should neutralize this acid by some or other ways and of course this is the treatment of this disease since last many centuries if a weak base is given it may or, or it will neutralize the acid and if the acid production is decreased then the symptoms of ulcer because of acid production will also decrease and if the acid production is decreased this will cause decrease change of pepsin from the pepsinogen and will decrease the ulcer potential of the pepsin also so the acid neutralizing capacity is an entity by which we calculate the potency of any antacid this is expressed in terms of numbers of milliequivalents of one molar hcl that that are brought down to ph of less than 3.5 in 15 minutes by a unit dose of preparation that is 1 gram by this we calculate the acid neutralizing capacity or the potency of antacid the first was systemic soda bicarbonate eno or something like that it has got a potent neutralizing capacity and acts instantly the neutralizing level is almost 12 milli equivalent but it should not be used for prolonged time sos basis it is okay but if we are taking it for long times it will cause alkalosis distension discomfort and blenching because of increased carbon dioxide productions and of course it is not going to decrease the etiology of the acid productions and in the long term it may cause sodium overload and the complication because of hypernatremia present day antacids are twi- uh, two types first is aluminum hydroxide and second is magnesium hydroxide this both has got a minimal acid neutralizing activity which can be given for long time this aluminum causes loose motion magnesium causes constipation and if we combine both the drugs in one bottle this both the side effect may be antagonized by each other and can be used for acid neutralizing activity if we add oxycetazine to this antacid it will take care of gastritic component also that is whenever the patient is having lot of vomiting after taking any amount of water food this oxytocin will cause local anesthetic action and hence it will be added advantage to this antacid the non buffer types are calcium carbonate the duration of actions are usually very less and should be taken in empty stomach the side effects as we have discussed aluminum causes constipation gas- gastric delay emptying and have astigmatic effects and also cause hypophosphatemia and osteomalacia magnesium will cause osmotic diarrhea and in renal failure aluminum toxicity and encephalopathy encephalopathy may occur so it is not to be given to be given in a patient of renal failure simethicon it decreases surface tension thereby reduce bubble formation that has got added advantage to prevent the reflex esophagitis gerd alginates 
these form a layer of foam on top of gastric contents and reduces reflexes oxycarzine it acts as a surface anesthetic for gastritic purpose this can be available in tablet powder chewable tablets effervescents or syrups a little bit about the sucral fat how it acts as a ulcer protective agent it is a salt of sucrose complex carbohydrate it is complex to sulfated aluminum hydroxide this is the basic aluminum salt the mechanism of action is in the acidic ph it polymerizes to viscous gel that adheres to the ulcer crater especially on the duodenal ulcer it precipitates protein on the surface protein and acts as a physical barrier the dietary protein also gets deposited over this forming a another coat and it decreases gastric emptying and causes gastric prostaglandin synthesis which has got a protective effect this sucral fat should be taken empty stomach one hour before meal a current antacid s2 blockers should be avoided when we are taking sucral fat it can be used in nsaid induced ulcers patient with continued smoking ICU and of course it is also topically used for bed sore burn dressing and excoriated skin dressings should be given before meal the minimal adverse effects are constipation and may inhibit the absorption of anti epileptics in long term then after local acid neutralizing activity we are going to the root cause of ulcer that is increase gastric production or increase activity of proton pumps this first we block this by s2 antagonist that is cimetidine ranitidine famotidine roxetidine nizatidine and lafotidine they are in the market since last almost 30 years in some or other combinations and they are very cheap they are cost effective and people used to take it for years and months together without having much side effects they act by reversibly competing inhibitor of h2 receptors they are very highly selective and has got no action on h1 or h3 receptors they act on all phase of gastric acid secretion that is cephalic gastric and duodenal phase they are very effective in inhibiting nocturnal that is basic basal acid secretion as it is depends largely on histamine they modest effects on meal stimulated acid secretion as it depends on gastrin acetylcholine and histamine they decreases the volume of pepsin and intrinsic factors are also decreased and of course they will have effect in 60 to 70 percent of the patients if given in a proper dosage they are good absorbed with good bioavailability absorption is not much interfered with the foods they crosses the placenta barrier and reaches the milk but had got a very poor penetration in brain and it is usually excreted in bile and urine and is not to be changed for any kidney or liver disease they are usually available in tablets and injectable in hospital setting they are extremely safe because people are using since last many 20 30 years some people are using since almost 10 12 years without any side effect either it is psychological or whatever but they feel comfortable after take, after taking one tablet of acelog so the main adverse uh, drug reactions are related to cimetidine that is entry anti androgenic effects like 
gynec painful gynecomastia because of increased prolactin secretions. They of course inhibit the cytochrome P450 enzymes and the drugs which are metabolized by this enzyme will have altered blood levels. Sometimes they causes headache, dizziness, bowel upset, dry mouth. If we give high slow, uh, if we give bolus in a short time, it may cause bradycardia, arrhythmias, cardiac arrest because sudden release of histamine and of course it should be used in frequent in an elderly patients. Almost all the drug has got a good bioavailability, bio half life is very less. So, we are supposed to give the drugs 6 to 8 hourly and they inhibit the cytochrome P450 and doses are accordingly. The least is for famotidine and highest is for simetidine. The Semitidine, ranitidine, ranitidine or H2 blockers are usually used in the healing of gastric and duodenal ulcer. It goes almost 70 percent effect in healing. They can also be used in ICU setting for stress ulcer and gastritis. GRD, Zollinger Ellison syndrome where famotidine is the drug of choice. It can also be used for prophylaxis or aspiration pneumonia and urticaria because of antihistaminic effects. The dose is varied, can be used OD, BD, HS and SOS accordingly. These are the doses which should be used in the patient. Lefotidine, it is a novel histamine H2 receptor blocker with gastroprotective activity. This exhibited potent and long lasting H2 blocking and prolonged anti secreting effects. In addition, lefotidine shows a gastroprotective effects against noxious agent induced gastric mucosal damage that is capsicacin sensitive afferent nerves. This drug is equal or superior to conventional H2 blockers in anti ulcer potency and may be used for the prevention of ulcer relapse and treatment of NSA, NSAID induced gastroduodenal damage. The last and the most effective drug for ulcer disease is proton pump inhibitor. What are proton pump? These are the, these are the pumps that is hydrogen potassium ATPase enzyme which actively secrete lot of hydrogen ion in the gastric mucosa concentrate the hydrogen ion in the stomach cavity by this enzyme and this hydrogen potassium ATPase enzyme increases decreases the acidity or pH to almost 2 to 3 in the highest time and this is the enzyme hydrogen potassium ATPase and this proton pump will cause irreversible blockage of this enzyme that is the enzyme will be blocked for 2 to 3 days and now the body has to make another another enzyme which take 3 to 5 days for its action and hence this drug will act for the total 3 to 5 days of the actual renewition of the enzymes. It is most effective drug in entire cell therapy. It is a product which requires activation in acidic environment. It blocks the enzyme irreversibly hydrogen potassium ATPase irreversible. The prototype is omniprazole, but others like Lenso, pentoprazole, rebiprazole and ismaprazole are also there with their very various 
effects and side effect profiles with and some are comfortable with pentoprazole some are comfortable with reviprazole some are comfortable with esmeprazole but the um, the prototype is omniprazole that we will see right now the mechanism of action is it substitute benzadiene derivative of course it is a product which gets activated by the acid contents in the stomach to the active component that is tetracyclic sulfonamide plus sulfonic acid it causes covalent binding with the sulfhydryl cysteines of the enzyme and cause irreversible inactivation of the pump molecule the charge form cannot diffuse back across the cannabinoid and hence the total or near total suppression of the acid stimulation that is almost 80 to 90% is suppressed after 2 to 3 days of drugs these are the biochemical structures of the omniprazole and the enzymes pharmacokinetic kinetics oral forms are prepared as acid resistant because they will usually go in the small intestine and will act from there after absorption they are distributed by blood to the parietal cell canal coli they irreversibly inactivate the proton pumps molecule but half life is very short that is 1 to 2 hours still action persists for 24 to 48 hours after single dose that is because of the irreversible activation of proton pump and new proton pump synthesis take time plateau state is usually attained after 4 to 5 days of dosing and of course the action lasts for 4 to 5 days even after the stoppage of the drug as we have discussed right now usually given empty stomach because food affects the absorption they should be given 30 minutes to one hour before food intake because an acidic ph in the parietal cell acid canaloi is required for the drug activation as we know this is a pro drug and food stimulate acid productions concomitant uses of other anti secretory drugs like h2 blockers should not be given it is a highly protein bound and rapidly metabolized by liver to by cytochrome p in cytochrome 3 4a so dose reduction is uh, required if the patient is having severe liver failure it is excreted in the kidney so no dose re uh, reduction is needed in a patient of renal failure the most common adverse effect are gi troubles in the form of nausea abdominal pain constipation flatulence and diarrhea subacute myopathy arthralgias headache skin rashes are very rarely seen and in prolonged use it may also causes gynecomastia erectile dysfunction leukopenia vitamin b12 deficiency and hypergastrinemia which may predispose predispose to rebound hypersecretion of gastric acid upon discontinuation of therapy and may promote the growth of gi tumor that is carcinoid tumors lot of interaction are there because of inhibition of cytochrome p450 it can be used or it is used for GERD peptic ulcers bleeding peptic ulcer zollinger ellison syndrome stress induced nsaid induced ulcers reducing the risk of duodenal ulcer recurrence associated with h pylori infections in aspiration pneumonia the doses are usually 20 to 40 mg in a single once a day empty stomach dose little bit about atropine this is a muscularic antagonist it blocks the m1 receptors will cause reduced acid production and abolishes gastrointestinal spasm so in a patient who had ulcers with spasm we can give muscarinic blockers similarly pirazepine and telazepine can also be given because it reduces meal stimulated hydrochloride acid secretion by reversible blockage of muscarinic receptor on the cell bodies of intraluminal cholinergic ganglia but they are very unpopular because they causes undue side effects of dry mouth and blurred visions in long term and bladder neck obstruction in elder, in elderly patients 
prostaglandin analogs not used very commonly theoretically it is a very good drugs because it decreases the seesaw which we have discussed but clinically had got lot of toxic effects very costly should be given injectably should require short dosing 4 to 6 hour dosing so it is not of much use it is also it is also used for abortic purposes that means it ha it has got a very potent action on the uterus so in a pregnant lady we should be very cautious in giving this drug it is usually given 200 microgram four times a day it causes diarrhea abdominal cramps uterine bleeding abortion exacerbation of inflammatory bowel disease and should be avoided in patients with this disorder and it is contraindicated in pregnancy because it is now officially used for abortic purpose also so it should not be used very frequently now we know that H. pylori is the major etiological agent in ulcer diseases and we know that if we are able to eradicate this pylori infections then the chances of ulcers are decreased by almost 80 percent and somehow in, in some patient the recurrence may occur after six months of proper dosage so we should try to prove that the ulcer is because of H. pylori and if it is proved we should try to eradicate this infective organism by proper drugs. Initially we used to give double therapy after that we had added one amoxicillin metronidazole by causing a triple therapy and in some patient in after adding tetracycline it is known, known as quadruple therapy in which we give four drugs to eradicate this bacterium the but in random, randomized case control study the best among the all therapy is the triple therapy in which we combine one antacid proton pump one antibiotic and one metronidazole group and this has to be given bd for almost 14 days to be followed by a proton pump for almost one to two month to cause the healing of ulcers if you had given only 14 days of triple therapy and had not been given the proton pump then the chances of eradication or healing ulcer may be less so you should always try to give the whole package to the patients and we will should go to prove this by a check endoscopy after two months so these are the in so these are the ingredients in triple therapy sometimes we use bismuth sometime we use tetracycline that is quadruple therapy and one antibiotic is officially used because probably it is having anaerobic component so metron result should be used to eradication of this bacterium in quadruple therapy we use in addition we use this tetracycline for therapeutic purpose a little bit about the colloidal bismuth it has got a pharmacological action it undergoes rapid dissolution in the stomach in bismuth oxychloride and citrate this bismuth coats ulcer and erosion protecting them from the acid and pepsin and increases prostaglandin and bicarbonate productions it is used as a part of triple therapy for h pylori eradications and of course it can also be used for the treatment of dyspepsia and traveler diarrhea so this was a small concise talk regarding the peptic ulcer diseases
there are lot of investigation but in all ulcer diseases the treatment is very simple either give proton pump for few weeks to months the patient usually recovers and if the patient does not recovers with this treatment you should think of some other diseases some other etiology some other diseases like a malignancy or obstruction or something unusual diseases which cannot be explained explained by this proton pumps because in a patient who had got any gastritis grd peptic ulcer diseases should get some or other response with this proton pump it is a very remarkable good drugs lot of people in this class must have taken must have prescribed this drug to their near and dear and you had seen personally that this specially given in adequate doses had got good effects and if the person is not getting relief by this drugs you should think of some other etiology of the disease rather than just prolonging that it is a acid disease acid disease and the patient lands in with some bad disease and it takes a bad credit to you so my dears try to learn the topic from your textbook and get the attendance marked on the particular si slide and if you had any query you can send the queries in the whatsapp group to me and i will try to help you of those queries thank you for your kind listening thank you एक बार इसको देख लो फिर इसको मैं अपलोड कर दूँ अभी बाप रे तो रिकॉर्डिंग बंद करेगी नहीं